Ankama, we need to talk. While I love that you folks update and keep the game alive, this is the third guide within a year I'm making for just one class in the game. I do appreciate the chance to make this one again, since I now have at least a nominally higher understanding of what the actual fog I am doing. But please, have mercy. What's that? Ankama plans to revamp secondary masteries soon and replace them with other masteries that are basically the same type but use different conditions to activate them. Uh... What is this build? All right, as we know, Ankama made some changes to the already revamped Foggernaut, where they changed how the class works in general. Originally, I planned to just make a companion video about the changes along with how to integrate the new turret into spell rotations. But I was planning to make this whole guide again once I had more hands-on time with the new Foggernaut. And well, here we are. I present to you the, no, I will not die, but thanks for asking, Rift Grinder Foggernaut build. There are quite a lot of changes compared to my old build, but the core and main source of damage is still water damage that comes from taking maximum advantage of the high pressure mechanic. Water is no longer the only form of meaningful damage in this build, as I have elevated fire damage to be part of the combat as well. Yes, I did use fire previously as well, but mostly for triggering the turret or to place glyphs. And while I still use glyphs occasionally, they're not in any meaningful role anymore. Plus, there's now one singular sad earth spell to act as burst damage. How does my new build operate? This build is a medium range damage dealer that uses both single target damage and AOE damage. Its primary elements will be water and fire with one earth spell. While the build is essentially a damage build, its primary function is to survive in rifts. The idea is to get a consistent decent score inside a rift. Note that this build is not limited to rifts, nor is it the absolute best build for rifts. But before we get into the nitty gritty, I am making this beginner friendly, or at least trying to, so if you don't actually care about why I take X or Y things, you can just skip to this timestamp where I show the deck code and stats or just look at the pinned comments where I place the stat point breakdown along with the deck code. And here we go, Tilda. Class Mechanics Foggernaut's class passive is called Sabotage Master. This grants every Foggernaut access to four active abilities that can't be removed but can be modified with the passives. They're always located in spell bar number three along with the extra abilities. Foggernaut has one extra resource to keep track of, which is a stasis point. Watfu and stasis usage are very important since many of the high impact abilities Foggernauts have access to need a combination of AP, WP, or SP. A quick note on how to generate WP and SP with Foggernaut. Every time you end your turn, you generate one Wakfu point. Every time your turret hits an enemy, you generate stasis points. If your SP is full, every additional SP you would have generated is turned into Wakfu instead. Abilities that come from the class passive are Microbot, Turret, Foginator, and Gunner. Microbot allows you to place nodes on the battlefield. If you link two or more nodes in a linear fashion, they will form a rail. This rail can be used for cheap and effective movement. If you move with the rail system, Every three cells you move on top of it uses only one MP. Keep in mind that if you choose to move one, two cells instead of three, you will still use one MP. To simplify, rails let you move further away as long as you stay on the rails. Turret is an ability that summons a turret on the battlefield. It has access to three attacks that it will use automatically if there are any targets it can hit. The abilities get stronger based on the level of the turret. You can level up your turret by casting the turret spell on top of it, and doing this will refund you 2 AP. The ability that the turret will use depends on your last active elemental spell. A fire spell will cause the turret to use distant shot, water will cause it to use alignment shot, and earth will cause it to use destruction shot. The fire turret will generate you stasis points and hit two targets that are furthest away from it. This will do no damage, but it's a safe way to regain SP and by far the fastest way. Note, the fire turret does need a line of sight to the targets. Water turrets will hit targets that are in line with the turret. As far as I've noticed, there's no distance limit as long as the target is in line with the turret and there's nothing blocking the line of sight. Earth will do a large AOE, but it will only hit cells that are close by. Water and Earth will still generate SP, but their hit conditions are more restrictive compared to fire. Think of Fire Turret as a 100% reliable way to generate SP. Note, the SP generated is tied to your turret level, so a level 4 turret will generate you 4 SP per targeted hits. 
Foginator will disable your elemental effects and change all damage you deal with spells or with the turret to stasis type damage. Stasis damage will always hit your highest mastery against the enemy's lowest resistance. So if you cast, let's say, Pilfer, a water spell, on an enemy whose lowest resistance is Earth, that water spell will now do Earth-type damage, but will calculate the damage done with your highest elemental mastery, in this example, with Water Mastery. Activating Foginator will also give you 50% more damage as long as you have Foginator active, but you will lose three stasis points at the end of the turn. This effect will end when you no longer have stasis points to upkeep it. Gunner can only be used if you're on top of your rails or in a singular microbot node. When activated, you lose the ability to move outside of the rails as long as Gunner is activated, but you get increased MP and range. Let's move on to elemental spells and discuss what I have chosen, my reasons for choosing them, and effective ways to use them. Spells. Water spells. First, a quick explanation about water spells. Each water spell cast will give you plus one high pressure. Once you have two points of high pressure, any water spell you cast will have a special effect. I have three spells from this branch. Current. I find this spell surprisingly useful. It has many use cases and does relatively good damage. It is conditional on getting a collision effect, which occurs when you push a target against something it can't move through, such as walls, your turret, or monsters. At maximum level with collision, this spell does 104 damage with 3 AP, 52 if no collision. This spell can be used to build distance between your targets, do damage, or be kept as a cheap and effective filler spell to manage your high pressure. Under two points of high pressure, this spell's effect is to push the target four cells instead of one. Next on the list is Pilfer, the old reliable. This spell gets a lot of use. It has decent reach, does good damage, 93, is cheap, 3 app, and is highly compatible with current. It also doesn't require line of sight, making it perfect for fighting enemies in sync with your turret. This spell is mostly used for damage and high pressure management. You shouldn't trigger the effect, but there may be situations where you can consider doing so, as it will debuff the target for two turns by removing 30% of their critical hit percent and block percent. However, keep in mind that if you use it, your overall damage output will suffer. Froth, the single most important spell you have. It does all right damage in an AOE, 123 damage, and at first glance, it doesn't seem like anything special, especially with its four AP cost. Where this spell shines is with its effect. Once you cast this with two points of high pressure, it will refund you four app, making this spell basically free as long as you cast it at the correct moments. Typical spell rotation looks more or less like this. Cast current two times to push enemies further away, cast froth to deal damage and regain four AP, then follow by casting pilfer two times to regain two high pressure. Next turn, you open with froth to do damage and regain four AP followed by two pilfers to build your high pressure to two again. Then you use froth again and finish with two X current to keep the enemy at a distance. It's stupidly effective as long as you can keep up with this simple pattern. But basically, as long as you can get two high pressure and reliably cast froth basically for free, anything will work here. Bonus spell to consider. If you can justify placing this on your deck by removing something else, adding evaporation is not a bad idea. This spell can come in extremely useful in many different situations. You can use it to escape, gain a more favorable position, for example, enemies' backs, or just as a distance builder or closer. It does kind of may damage, but with too high pressure, this lets you move just incredibly on the map. The pressure effect adds four ranges to this spell, so this baby will let you just fly like a jet engine. Fire spells. I have taken three spells from this branch as well, but a quick disclaimer about fire before we get into it. This branch is at times incredibly frustrating to use since a few spells have downright bizarre range conditions. Yes, I know why they're there, but that does not make it any more fun to use. Basically, this branch is meant to be played in conjunction with your turret. Almost all spells have effects if you hit the turret with them, and their range conditions take into account that your turret might be blocking your line of sight, which alone is super nice. But the issue lies in other maps that are inconsistent, Sometimes you have a line of sight, sometimes you do not, and many times you can't trust the terrain to tell you if you have it or not, even though the tactical mode should actually do this, but it just doesn't. Fire hits hard and is good, but sometimes it will drive you crazy. Anyhow, let's talk about the spells and why I took them. Fire Thrower. I actually really like this spell. 
The damage is a bit so-so at 123, but it also reduces enemy range by one for a turn and can be turned into a good-sized AoE. It also plays really well with my linear playstyle, so it's a good turn ender when you want to start regaining stasis or have a favorable AoE situation. When you cast this on your turret, it will cause a cone-shaped AoE in front of it, and it still blinds anyone it hits as an AoE. Charring, this hits hard, has decent range, and with the turret does amazing AoE, especially when combined with Foginator and Stasis. This spell can be used to utterly wreck most targets in the game, but it's annoying to use. Not the spell's fault, and you can manage this annoyance by making sure you're casting this behind your turret, since this spell can only be cast on targets, you don't have a line of sight meaning something has to block your vision. This alone is perfectly fine, but sometimes the game will tell you that yes, you can use it, only for the spell not to activate because, surprise, surprise, the game lied to you. Sometimes even when the line of sight by all possible metrics should be blocked, the spell decides you actually do have sight and therefore can't cast this spell. Despite the finicky nature of it, it's still absolutely worth it. Just don't rely on it too much and try to get mostly turret shots with it, flambe. I have a soft spot for damage spells that also act as utility. This is one of them. Honestly, you could replace this with Blazing Fire and it would be just fine, but I just kinda love this spell. It does okay damage, 85, while being cheap, 3 AP, and has very good reach. When cast on the turret, it will leave behind Fire Glyphs that do damage, 96, if something starts or ends its turn in them. With the correct passive, you can also use this as a Fire AoE and leave behind Glyphs. It's just a delight to use, especially if you fail to position yourself well. This happens a lot for me since I like to alt-tab outside occasionally, and it keeps biting me in my arse. Earth Spell. I just have one spell here. Shebang. Now you might wonder why I keep this with practically no Earth Masteries and the spell's range being practically melee. Well, with Foginator active, the type of damage this spell does is more or less irrelevant. 278 damage when used for targets with more than 90% of their health left tends to be just one shot for most targets. And that range part? Well, we will be rectifying this with the passives, but not quite yet, because up next we have active Foggernaut spells. To save time, I could say take everything else but Ambush, but that wouldn't be very productive. So let's cover them one by one and why and where they should be used. We start with my favorite active ability, Hypertension. I like to have options, and this spell just gives them to me. It can be used as a damage spell for 3 AP and 2 stasis points. You'd be doing 144 light damage, which is delightful. Especially if you failed at positioning well with Flambe and this spell, you can still do effective damage while basically improvising. But you can also use this in combination with your turret. A level 4 turret marked with hypertension will just obliterate whatever it hits. It's just a good spell to have, and yes, you can eat your turret with this. It will heal you according to how much HP your turret had left, so eating your max level turret can potentially save your robotic bacon, but honestly, you should not do this if you can avoid it. Leveling a turret takes at least three turns while you also get two wakfu points as well, if you eat your turret. You really shouldn't do this, but you do have the option to do it. And if I am being honest, it has saved me more times than I care to count. Stasis Flux, another good spell you should try to keep active as much as possible. It comes with a high SP cost, but the effect it gives you is absolutely worth it. For 2 AP and 3 SP, you gain plus 2 range for your spells and 30% damage done, or you can cast this on an enemy, and they will lose 150% resistance for 2 turns. In both cases, this should be active before you cast Foginator since these two combined are just brutal. Armor Plating. It's useful. It's a bit underwhelming, but for two Wakfu points, you get 10% of your own HP as armor, which is actually really useful, and you can use it on your allies as well. And since with a max level turret, you will never run out of Wakfu, there is no reason to just throw this out every chance you get. Yes, you can cast this on your turret as well as on enemies, but the flavor text does a bad job of explaining what it does. Basically, it will steal armor from the target if the target has armor. It's a bit confusing to use this way, so I'd suggest not doing so, but it could be a perfectly fine option in PvP situations. Casting this will also give block to your turrets or blockades, so for that reason alone, it's good to spam this. Machinery. I'll be honest, I use this primarily as a stab spell, but the effect is definitely useful if you cast this on yourself. That being said, every movement you make on your rails costs only 1 MP, 
The amount of distance you can build with this puts most movement classes to deep, depressing shame. It has no AP cost and it only needs two wakfu points. And finally, transition. I'll admit using this can feel a bit clunky, and you can actively screw yourself over with this since it will take you to the closest microbot within four cells. And if there are multiple of them, you have absolutely no input on where you end up. But it does not care about line of sight, so you can teleport behind walls. You can use it in tandem with microbots to pull off some interesting teleports. This is basically the reason why I don't carry evaporation in my deck, since I can use this spell to do everything it does but with lower AP cost and potentially better results. It just needs more thought put into it when you use it, and you can use this to move your turret around and that is useful. Microbot plus transition in one turn costs you 2 AP and 2 wakfu, and with this price you can basically place your turret wherever you want as long as the turret is not further than 7 cells from the microbot you plan to move it to. You don't 100% need this, but I'd recommend using it. Now we can move on to passives. Foggernaut has quite the collection of different sorts of passives, and while you indeed have a lot of options, it may feel like you don't actually have enough of them. I am more or less in agreement with this, since many of them will limit your abilities in a way that feels restrictive or just not bring anything useful to the table. So I would highly recommend thinking about adding quest passives to the mix if you think they would make your life easier. If you don't know what I am talking about, you can get extra universal abilities by completing the Rock Island quest line. Now onto the passives. Energy Moderation. This is an acquired taste, and I would completely understand not taking this. The effect of 1 MP, 30% armor generation, and 2 range sounds good, but it also tinkers with your minimum range. So a spell that has a minimum cast range of 3 becomes a minimum cast range of 5. Since many of the maps are quite small, this can be extremely annoying to manage. You can find yourself in positions where you have absolutely nothing to cast and have to rely on your weapons for damage which can feel frustrating beyond belief. But if you can manage your position and predict where mobs move, this passive can be amazing, especially with Foginator active and combined with Shebang. Remember, this spell has a maximum range of three, so it can barely be used as a ranged spell. But with this passive active and with Max Wakfu, your Shebang can reach stuff quite nicely. Also, you can more or less manipulate the passive by simply not keeping your Wakfu at maximum. It's useful, but it does have the potential to mess with you. Mechanical Substitution. This passive changes how your turret interacts with your spells. If you cast a water spell on your turret, you will switch positions with it. If you cast a fire spell on it, the resulting AoE will be two cells larger. Flamethrower, AoE, and charring will become more circular, so keep that in mind. Meaning your flambe will also now act as an AoE when you throw the spell on the turret, and it will leave glyphs. If you cast an Earth spell on it, the turret will attract objects, mobs, and players towards one cell per AP used in a cross-shaped pull path. This passive is useful and should be included. I don't think there's a way around it. I did try to fiddle with activation and had a lot of fun with it, but sadly it just won't work with this particular build. This passive simply gives you too much utility. You can use it to escape, reposition, or to set up a fire AoE, and it makes your already existing fire AoE just better. Serene Conquest. This is an odd choice, but hear me out. This will give you 50% block when you're not in gunner state, and for me, that basically just means 50% block all of the time since I rarely use gunner. Yes, it will reduce your available stasis points by two, but I don't think it's a massive drawback, even though stasis is the resource you need for basically every other turn with this build. The reason is the two following passives. Patience. If you start your turn with max stasis points, you will get an additional 2 SP added to your cap. The maximum stack you can get with this passive is an extra 4. Yes, they do not replenish, but you can re-trigger this effect by going under your maximum stasis cap. And that brings me to immediate execution. This passive might be a bit controversial since once you activate this, you will lose all stasis points you had at the end of the turn. But keep in mind that this is exactly what I want to do. Basically, your Foginator status will only last the turn you activate it and automatically end at the end of your turn. Your turret will still hit stasis because the turret will count as your turn. But here's the deal. Your Foginator will now deal an extra 30% stasis damage, and you gain 3 AP for that turn. This is just good. 
and since you will lose your stasis anyway, you might as well cast every stasis-related ability you can at the same time. Activating Stasis Flux and throwing Hypertension along with the usual spell rotations, combined with four Froths and four AP Refund, will make your turn high impact. The amount of stuff you can pull off in that one turn, especially if you can reach every mob, will easily let you finish multiple waves within one turn, and your biggest adversary will be the Turn Timer. The Foginator does have a cooldown between casts, but that turn will be your prepping turn where you replenish your stasis, set up your high pressure, and try to arrange possible AoE situations for the next turn. And since your Flux is still active here, you're still relatively powerful. Remember, the turret will give you SP based on its level, so as long as your turret is alive and has targets it can hit, you're perfectly fine. And then the final passive, Carnage. I'll be honest, this is just a filler passive and kind of the only one that actually fits here reliably. You can change this to, let's say, Brutal Transfer, but personally, with one turret at level 4, I think this is more reliable. Alright, that covers spells, actives, and the passives. Here's the deck code that will import this particular setup to your own deck. Since I'm fully aware of how painful it is to do this import by hand, I'll be pinning a comment with this code along with a breakdown of the stat points. Speaking of which, here are the stat points and their distribution. Intelligence. Place 10 points in resistance. This stat cannot be ignored. This game has a ridiculous amount of damage modifiers, so if your base defenses are not solid, you will simply die. The more resistance you have, the better. As a rule of thumb, a 70% resistance score per elemental tree is the absolute lowest you should have, and even this, in my opinion, is dodgy. I can't stress this enough. Resistance is important. After this, I always advocate for maximizing your HP pool. While natural armor gets you a higher starting health, it will leave your maximum health points dangerously low. This game is filled with many mobs and bosses that will absolutely wreck your HP pools, and they're often not alone in that fight. If you're doing group fights like Dungeon, your ENI or whoever is healing will be able to keep you up, but people often tend to forget that the healer class is not just there to heal. They manage status effects, debuff enemies, or deal damage. The higher your maximum HP pool, the safer you are. Just a 1000 GP difference in your HP pool can often be the decisive factor that keeps your arse alive. A simplified explanation for this is that a higher HP pool lets you make more mistakes. And you're going to make mistakes. It's just the nature of this game. Strength. This part is very hard to fail at. You basically pick damage stats based on your spells and primary way you deal damage. Since I'm a distance fighter with an emphasis on single target damage and who can switch to AOE mode if the situation presents itself, my most important damage types are Elemental Mastery, Distance Mastery. And in my case, I distributed them as Elemental 18, Single Target 20, and Distance 20. Ideally, you want to look at what your gear gives you and place these stats accordingly reminding you that with a booster you can change your stats points at any moment you wish. It may seem silly, but you'd be shocked at how many people are not aware of this. Agility. I elected to take 10 willpower and place the rest in dodge. This is more or less a section where you can do whatever you think is best. I personally don't want to get tied down since the energy moderator basically forces you to be far away from mobs. You can skirt around this by just minding where you are, but better safe than sorry. Willpower is self-explanatory. It guards you against MP and app loss. Fortune. Another place where you should consult your own gear. Critical hits are the ever-popular choice here. So I took 20 crits, and since I already have 50% block from the passive, I might as well add a few points here as well. Currently, I have 10 here, but I do change my stat points quite often, so this number changes between 10 to 20 depending on if I think I can lower other stats. The rest are placed on critical DMG, but this also changes as I often switch these points to Berserk on the fly. Sacrificing one stats page for alternative stats points is not a bad idea if you're a similar sort of person who changes them often to fit different situations. Berserk DMG is still an absurdly strong multiplier, so you might want to consider this. At least during 1.79, who knows what Ankama is planning with the upcoming stats revamp. Majors. It depends mostly on what you're using gear-wise. For example, if you get 12 AP and 6 MP from your equipment and sublimations, you can basically pick whatever strikes your fancy, but damage done and elemental resistances should always be picked. 
Personally, I went with 1 AP, 1 MP, and damage plus resistances, gearing, and sublimating. There is not one correct way here. This game is filled with options, so instead I will be giving examples of sublimations that I personally find useful, along with a couple of tricks on how to farm shards and acquire gear with relatively low effort. Here are the sublimations I am using planning to use. My gearing process is still underway. I tested one potential gear setup, but came to the conclusion certain parts of it just didn't work. Currently, I'm trying to claw some commas back by reselling some stuff, so that was smart. Featherweight AP returns swiftness 2, length about turn save for relic and epic sublimations. I'm using peaceful and elemental concentration. I'm also giving some serious thought about taking precaution, but what I want to achieve with this sublimation setup is a bit higher damage output and higher control over my AP. About Turn is more or less a filler sublimation that I personally find super useful since it just removes the fear of backstab damage, well from melee at least. Swiftness, because MP is life and I will not give that up. I plan to compensate for the 10% damage loss with Featherweight, which gives you X amount of damage per MP that exceeds 4. High MP will play well into Peaceful Sublimation and will help me sustain even higher block percent and raise my critical rate to acceptable levels without having to look for high crit gear or other sublimations to patch that particular flaw in my build. Most of my spells are linear, so length is kind of just a no-brainer. Gives damage as long as you are aligned with the target and further than two cells away. There are a lot of ways to utilize sublimations and you can take any build to just wild paths with different sublimation selections. I would highly recommend browsing these around if you don't like this particular sublimation selection. For the epic sublimation, I'm using Elemental Concentration once I get around to crafting it. It simply pairs too well with the Foggernaut Stasis mechanic by raising my highest mastery by 30% while lowering the rest by 30%. Sure, it does more or less steer me towards using fire only when Foggenate is active, but since it's what I tend to begin with, I don't see it as a downside. That being said, I am also considering Wield-type Dagger, since I don't really go for the backstab that often, and that solid 25% more damage is indeed tempting, especially since I do tend to favor daggers over shields. A couple of tips for farming gear, leveling, and how to get a good set of sublimations relatively easily. Alright, this section is dedicated to new or out-of-the-loop people trying to get back into farming stuff or leveling. Riffs. By all that is mechanical, do riffs. Like seriously, drop everything you're doing and go grind them. They don't require you to have a party, so they're entirely soloable with only one character. If you enter alone, you will get a lot of buffs that you can use to clear waves. And if you think you might die, you can simply kill everything apart from one mob and just run around. And you'll win it eventually at turn 40. This said, the more waves you can down, the better rewards you can get. If you play solo or just want your daily exp doing one, Two rifts a day will get your level up so damn fast that you're going to have to re-gear basically every week. The amount of high-value pets alone you can drop is jaw-dropping. I basically funded my entire current gear set that I am using now at level 230. Not complete yet though, but I am missing basically just a different EPAs, one more socket in my amulet, and a few sublimations. It's all funded by me just spamming various rifts around mostly the moon rift. It's quick, it's simple, and it is worth it. All right, enough simping for rifts few words before I go. It might not seem like it considering the quality of this text, but this took a long time to think and write up, like really long, like I rewrote this multiple times long, and it's still, pardon my French, but utter shite. I don't actually mind it since it does let me practice writing in English, and I genuinely enjoy doing this type of stuff. So if you got this far by Octopodus' long and slimy tentacles, please fiddle with the thumb icons and manifest your mouth sounds in text form in the comments. I found this fella on YouTube who streams Wakfu quite often and is using a VTuber avatar and makes just amazing stuff with Wakfu, so I would highly recommend checking them out. I'll link the guy in the pinned comment.